Hi, boys and girls. I'm Debbie Lincoln, back to read you some more stories. The first one is called Strega Nona, and it's an original tale written and illustrated by Tommy D. Paola. Strega Nona. In a town in Calabria, a long time ago, there lived an old lady everyone called Strega Nona, which meant Grandma Witch. Although all the people in town talked about her in whispers, they all went to see her if they had troubles. Even the priest and the sisters of the convent went because Strega Nona did have a magic touch. She could cure a headache with oil and water and a hairpin. She made special potions for girls who wanted husbands. And she was very good at getting rid of warts. But Strega Nona was getting old and she needed someone to help her keep her little house and garden. So she put up a sign in the town square. And Big Anthony, who didn't pay attention, went to see her. Anthony, said Strega Nona, you must sweep the house and wash the dishes. You must weed the garden and pick the vegetables. You must feed the goat and milk her, and you must fetch the water. For this, I will give you three coins and a place to sleep and food to eat. Oh, grazie, said Big Anthony. The one thing you must never do, said Strega Nona, is to touch the pasta pot. It is very valuable, and I don't let anyone touch it. Oh, see, si, yes, said Big Anthony. And so the days went by. Big Anthony did his work, and Strega Nona met with the people who came to see her for headaches and husbands and warts. Big Anthony had a nice bed to sleep in next to the goat shed, and he had food to eat. One evening, when Big Anthony was milking the goat, he heard Strega Nona singing. Peeking in the window, he saw Strega Nona standing over the pasta pot. She sang, Bubble, bubble, pasta pot, boil me some pasta nice and hot. I'm hungry and it's time to sup. Boil enough pasta to fill me up. And the pasta pot bubbled and boiled and was suddenly filled with steaming hot pasta. Then Strega Nona sang, Enough, enough pasta pot. I have my pasta nice and hot. So simmer down my pot of clay until I'm hungry another day. How wonderful, said Big Anthony. That's a magic pot for sure. And Strega Nona called Big Anthony in for supper. But too bad for Big Anthony because he didn't get to see Strega Nona blow three kisses to the magic pasta pot. And this is what happened. The next day, when Big Anthony went to the town square to fetch the water, he told everyone about the pasta pot. <laughs> and naturally, everyone laughed at him because it sounded so silly. A pot that cooked all by itself? <laughs> You'd better go confess to the priest, Big Anthony, they said. Such a lie. And Big Anthony was angry, and that wasn't a very good thing to be. I'll show them, he said to himself. Someday I will get the pasta part and make it cook, and then they'll be sorry. That day came sooner than even Big Anthony would have thought, because two days later, Strega Nona said to Big Anthony, Anthony, I must go over the mountain to the next town to see my friend Strega Amelia. Sweep the house and weed the garden. Feed the goat and milk her, and for your lunch, there are some bread and cheese in the cupboard. And remember, don't touch 
pasta, pasta pot. Oh, yes, yes, Dragonuna, said Bing Anthony. But inside he was thinking, my chance has come. As soon as Stregonona was out of sight, Big Anthony went inside, pulled the pasta pot off the shelf, and put it on the floor. Now, let's see if I can remember the words, said Big Anthony. And Big Anthony sang, Bubble, bubble, pasta pot. Boil me some pasta nice and hot. I'm hungry and it's time to sup. Boil me enough to fill me up. And sure enough, the pot bubbled and boiled and began to fill up with pasta. Aha, said Big Anthony, and he ran to the town square, jumped on the fountain and shouted, everyone get forks and plates and platters and bowls. Pasta for all at Streganona's house. Big Anthony has made the magic pasta pot work. Of course, everyone laughed, but ran home to get forks and plates and platters and bowls. And sure enough, when they got to Streganona's, the pasta pot was so full, it was beginning to overflow. Big Anthony was a hero. He scooped out pasta and filled the plates and platters and bowls. There was more than enough for all the townspeople, including the priest and sisters from the convent. And some people came back for two and three helpings, but the pot was never empty. When all had had their fill, Big Anthony sang, Enough, enough, my pasta pot. I have my pasta nice and hot. So simmer down my pot of clay until I'm hungry another day. But, alas, he did not blow the three kisses. He went outside to the applause of the crowd. Big Anthony took a bow. He was so busy listening to the compliments from everyone that he didn't notice the pasta pot was still bubbling and boiling until a sister from the convent said, Oh, Big Anthony, look! And pasta was pouring out of the pot all over the floor of Streganona's house and was coming out the door. Big Anthony rushed in and shouted the magic words again, but the pot kept bubbling. He took the pot off the floor, but pasta kept pouring from it. Big Anthony grabbed a cover and put it on the pot and sat on it. But the pasta raised the cover and Big Anthony as well and spilled on the floor of Streganona's house. Stop, yelled Big Anthony, but the pasta did not stop. And if someone hadn't grabbed poor Big Anthony, the pasta would have covered him up. The pasta had all but filled the little house. Out of the windows and through the doors came the pasta and the pot kept right on bubbling. The townspeople began to worry. Do something, Big Anthony, they shouted. Big Anthony sang the magic song again, but without the three kisses, it did no good. By this time, the pasta was on its way down the road and all the people were running to keep ahead of it. We must protect our town from the pasta, shouted the mayor. Get mattresses, tables, doors, anything to make a barricade. But even that didn't work. The pot kept bubbling and the pasta kept coming. We are lost, said the people and the priest and the sisters of the convent began praying. The pasta will cover our town, they cried. And it certainly would have, had Strega Nona not come down the road home from her visit. She didn't have to look twice to know what had happened. She sang the magic song and blew three kisses. And with a sputter, the pot stopped boiling and the pasta came to a halt. 
Oh, Glossy, thank you, Streganona, the people cried. But then they turned on poor big Anthony. String him up, the men of the town shouted. Now wait, said Streganona. The punishment must fit the crime. And she took a fork from a lady standing nearby and held it out to big Anthony. All right, Anthony, you wanted pasta from the magic pot, Streganona said, and I want to sleep in my little bed tonight, so start eating. And he did. Poor big Anthony. And Streganona slept in her little bed that night, and poor big Anthony had a very big, full belly. The end. So what did you learn from that? Maybe when somebody tells you to do something, there's a reason and you should listen. And the second book I want to read for you is called I Don't Want to Be a Frog. It's written by Dev Petty and illustrated by Mike Bolt. Let me ask you something. If you could be any animal in the world, what would it be? Probably not a frog, right? Exactly. I don't want to be a frog. I want to be a cat. You can't be a cat. Why not? Because you're a frog. I don't like being a frog. It's too wet. Well, you can't be a cat. I want to be a rabbit. You can't be a rabbit. Why not? Look, I can hop. Sure, but where are your long ears? Besides, what's wrong with being a frog? I don't like being a frog. It's too slimy. That may be, but you can't be a rabbit. I want to be a pig. You can't be a pig. Why not? Most of all, because you're a frog, but also because you don't have a curly tail or eat garbage. Well, I can eat garbage. Everyone says that until they eat garbage. Sorry, you can't be a pig. I want to be an owl. Of course you want to be an owl. Being an owl is the greatest thing ever. Boy, you would love being an owl. So can I be an owl then? No, of course not. Why not? One, you don't have wings. Two, you don't look wise. Three, you can't turn your head all the way around. Four, you are a frog. And what's wrong with being a frog anyway? Too much bug eating. I see. But still, no being an owl for you. Why so glum? I don't want to be a frog. What do you want to be then? Not a frog. I want to be a cat or a rabbit or a pig or an owl, something cute and warm. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I love eating cats. I love eating rabbits and pigs and owls too. And I'm pretty hungry. I might just go gobble something up right now. That's terrible. It's who I am. But guess the one thing I never eat. Badgers? Oh, I eat badgers. Lots of badgers. Frogs? Bingo. Why don't you eat frogs? Because they're too wet and slimy and full of bugs. Oh, so it's good to be a frog? Yep. I guess you can't fight nature. We are what we are. You are a fierce hunter. And you are a wet, slimy, bug-eating, 
very lucky frog, and you should just be happy you're not a fly. What's wrong with being a fly? Yum. The end. So that book tell, tells you to just be happy with who you are and what you are. And I hope you always will be. Thanks for listening, kids. Hi, this is Jamie. I have two books for you today on Storytime. The first one is called Mr. Puskins and Little Whiskers. And it's written and illustrated by Sam Lloyd. This is the story of a little girl called Emily and her dear cat, Mr. Puskins. They thought life couldn't get any better. Then one day, Emily announced that she had a fabulous surprise for Mr. Puskins. He was very excited. Emily fetched a large cardboard box, and inside the box was a kitten. This is Little Whiskers, said Emily. She has come to live with us. She's only a tiny kitten, so we need to take care of her. I'm sure you two will be the best of friends, smiled Emily, so I'll leave you to play lovely games together. Not sure if Mr. Puskins likes this idea. Mr. Puskins needed to be alone. He was somewhat disappointed with his fabulous surprise, and he certainly wasn't in the mood for lovely games. Little Whiskers wasn't in the mood for lovely games either. The pesky kitten took great delight in running all Miss Puskins special in ruining all of Mr. Puskins' special times. She ruined telly time. She ruined meal time. She ruined play time. She ruined nap time. And when Emily wasn't looking, Little Whiskers ruined everything. Mr. Puskins couldn't bear it any longer. Something had to be done. So that evening, Mr. Puskins wrote a letter. To whom it may concern, I am displeased with my fabulous surprise. I find the kitten extremely irritating and wish to return her ASAP, which means as soon as possible. Yours, fed uppingly, Mr. P. Then Mr. Puskin settled down for a nice long sleep. Suddenly, a hideous noise woke him. He dashed to see what was going on. Clunk, clunk, bam, bam. Emily dashed too, and who did she see? Mr. Puskins. And she gasped, you know better than to play such a terrible tune at this time of night. You might have woken little whiskers. Emily banished Mr. Puskins outside. You need to think about what you've done wrong, she said. But Mr. Puskins hadn't done anything wrong. And as the rain turned to snow, he thought about his cozy home. He reached up to the window to take a peek. That wretched kitchen kitten, she was already sitting in Mr. Puskin's favorite spot by the fireside. And Mr. Puskins was furious. But Little Whiskers wasn't enjoying the fireside. She knew she had been behaving naughtily, not Mr. Puskins. How she wished there was a way she could make things better. And there was. Little Whiskers leapt onto the piano. Bam, bam, clunk, clunk, boom, boom, boom. In rushed Emily. Oh, good gracious, she gasped. Little Whiskers, it was you that played that terrible tune, wasn't it? Meow, admitted the kitten. Emily hurried outside. My poor Mr. Puskins. Please forgive me, she begged, and of course Mr. Puskins did. Little Whiskers asked Mr. Puskins to forgive her too, and eventually Mr. Puskins did. Mr. Puskins didn't send the letter after all. He decided Little Whiskers could stay. This is the end of the story of a little girl called Emily and her dear cats, Mr. Puskins and Little Whiskers. And now... Life is perfect.
Hope you like that one. I have another one. This one's about a duck. It's about the duck who didn't like water. My goodness. And it's written by Steve Small. <coughs> there was once a duck who didn't like water. The duck didn't like swimming in it or paddling in it. And the duck didn't like when it rained. Not even if it rained just a little bit. On rainy days, duck liked nothing more than curling up with a good book and a hot drink. I don't need to go outside, duck thought. I've got everything I need right here. And mostly that was true. One very windy and rainy night, the duck was woken up by a loud noise and discovered a hole in the roof. Well, I can't fix that tonight, Duck thought. So Duck popped outside for a bucket and found an unexpected visitor who was lost, very lost. Why don't you rest here for the night where it's warm and dry, asked Duck. Frog, who was the visitor, cheerfully agreed even though Frog liked water very much. The next morning, Duck said, we need to get you home, but first we need to find out where home actually is. Okay, said Frog. Ribbit. So off they went. They searched everywhere, but they couldn't find Frog's home. So they stopped for some lunch. They set off again, but no matter who they asked or where they looked, they still couldn't find Frog's home. So that night, they ate dinner and read each other's stories. Good night, good night, and went to bed. Ribbit. The next morning, Pelican dropped by. Hello, Frog. You're a long way from home. Wait, said Duck. Do you know where Frog lives? Sure, it's all the way over in the next river, Pelican replied. Need a lift? By way of a goodbye, Duck gave Frog two gifts, a good book and a small umbrella. Frog said a big thank you, Ribbit. And moments later, Frog was gone. Days went by and everything was the same as before, but it felt different. Something was missing. So Duck set off. And though it rained and poured, and the wind blew this way and that, Duck did not give up until, quite suddenly, Duck found Frog. Home doesn't feel like home if you're not there, Duck said. And Frog agreed, Rivet. So Duck and Frog returned to their old routines. They visited their new friends, read stories to each other, and perhaps most importantly of all, they fixed the hole in the roof. Hope you enjoyed that one. See you next time. Bye. Hi again. I just found another book. It's also about ducks. So I figured I'd read that as well. It's called Duck, Duck, Moose. And it's written by Dave Horowitz. One day in the great north woods. Sure is getting cold, said Duck. I'm f f freezing, said the other duck. Just the way I like it, said Moose. But Bear was already hibernating. You gotta be kidding, said Moose. I guess I'll have to go and get pancakes by myself. But the pancake hut was closed until spring. This is going to be one long, lonely winter, thought Moose. You guys still have room for me? 
and away they went. Hey, said Duck, I see New York City. Hey, said the other duck, I see Washington, D.C. Hey, said Moose, I got pee. Somewhere in Georgia, the friends got stuck in a traffic jam. Row, row, row your boat, sang Duck. Gently down the stream, sang the other duck. Oh, brother, said Moose. Their first stop was at the beach. Look, said Duck, a shell. Look, said other duck, a starfish. Look, said Moose, a sea monster. <laughs> Next stop, Larry's, you pick it. I picked an orange, said Duck. I picked a grapefruit, said Other Duck. I picked me, said Moose. And the fun went on and on and on. No, cried Moose, I don't want to go home yet. Sure is good to be back, said Duck. It's getting kind of warm, said Other Duck. Just the way I like it, said Moose. A little different from when they left. The end. See you next time.